Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sam McCollum and I'm the Floyd County 4-H educator all the way down here down south. My name is Gail O'Connor, 4-H uh, educator in LaPorte County. And I am Todd Geiger, the 4-H youth educator in Whitley County. And I'm Danielle Sands, a 4-H STEM specialist at the State 4-H office. My section of the NYSD uh, National Youth Science Day slash STEM Challenge um, Greatest Hits was the Rockets to the Rescue, which was a program that came out uh, back in 2014, which was actually two years before I even started in 4-H and has become my favorite pro, uh, uh, NYSD um, kit. And I'll explain to you why in just a minute. So, uh, one of the reasons why I like this kit isn't necessarily um, the huge list of what's in it, because that can be extremely uh, daunting. Um, it, uh, the Rockets to the Rescue is a, um, a kit that is designed to let, let youth run wild with their imagination. Um, you give them a scenario that involves things like um, you need to be able to get food to a a certain area and things like helicopters or uh, traveling by foot isn't plausible. So the kids or the youth participants are actually supposed to uh, design a rocket that can then travel into the area and drop off food um, a certain spot. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I like it. It, it, it kind of gives them a real straightforward mission. Um, and it really has that one topic that really they need to work on. So looking at that list, um, that would be stuff that normally would come in the kit, but because these kits are more than five years old, there's a good chance that you will not have all that material there. So Just to kind of go off of what, what I was showing with the what, what's in the kit, I didn't want individuals to go through their um, uh, you know, kits and, and see, or the facilitator guides and see that there's a huge amount of stuff that's needed, or if there's a lot of stuff that is missing, um, that's just bound to happen, especially when it is a material that is consumable. All right. A lot of this material, when kids use it for their rockets to, to build, um, you cannot get back. Okay. So much like with BioFuel Blast, it is a lot of consumables that you will have to, to um, you know, replenish over time. So um, that's, that's one of the things. Now, with, with this particular um, kit, uh, even the launcher, um, sometimes, again, it's six years old. So you have to understand that you'll either be missing parts or you won't have a launcher at all. And um, that's okay. Launchers actually can be built um, with you know, less than $10. And in most cases, you'll want to have uh, two launchers anyway, if you have a larger a group of kids. So go ahead and, and move on. It's got the guy with the question marks. He says overwhelmed. <laughs> so when it comes down to this particular um, uh, program, um, it has one objective. Um, and it's to design, build, and test a propulsion system and prototype food transportation device, and in this case, an FTD, that can accurately deliver its food payload to a specific target. They will, um, one of the cool things about this, this particular um, NYSC project is it teaches kids and participants to be resourceful. Um, they don't get unlimited supplies. They're only given a limited amount of stuff that they have to work with to build this rocket to then send to the area that they're um, supposed to be. So um, I like it because in some cases when I'm working with older kids, I will actually um, reduce the amount of supplies that they get just to see how creative they can be. Um, so personally, like I, like I said, so you can, you can make it harder or easier to work with. Um, you can change it in the book. It tells you that you will work, you can work with raisins as part of the food supply that they have to put on there. Um, you can change it to be something a little more difficult to work with, so like a large marshmallow instead of a bunch of uh, small raisins, or um, and so on and so forth, or an item that is slowly melting, um, so they might have a time limit, or it could be causing damage to their rocket because of the, the liquid. So being able to really adjust your program to the youth and age 
it really makes this your activity. Um, you don't, just because it has it in the facilitator guide doesn't mean you have to stick by it. In some cases, when Todd was talking about his biofuels, try other things. Um, always test it out, but it's always going to be, uh, take that one step to, to make the kids do some critical thinking as opposed to doing, all right, let's just send some uh, raisins in there. Um, I like to do this program with, after school. Um, it takes multiple sessions. Um, that's okay. Um, with this kind of thing, um, you'll want to, you know, put names on them. They'll design their rockets a specific way. Um, I like to have one session to build, and then I like to have one session to launch. Um, it kind of gives them that breakup of, of time between the two it, that way, because I know some kids, when they work together, they don't always work together well. Um, it gives them time to kind of, uh, uh, you know, relieve some stress by working with groups and then they get to come back the next day and shoot these rockets and, and uh, the whole time. So it gives you a lot more time. Um, there are some prep tips um, that I have posted on here. Uh, you definitely wanna make sure you have enough supplies for each participant. Um, my one rule is always prepare like you have five more people attending um, any event. So always, always prepare like you have more than you have needed because either A, you're missing supplies from one kit so you can take from another or B, a couple extra people show up. So always be prepared. Um, check your uh, extension office. At the end, I was uh, making sure, um, you know, this is kind of modified for volunteers too. Um, you know, make sure you have a built launcher. Um, if not, uh, again, launchers cost less than $10 to make at a local hardware store. There's a list in the, the guide. Um, uh, in this, the, the manual that says use a cork for the, um, rocket, you don't have to use a piece of duct tape. It works just as well. And it's way less expensive than going out and buying a, uh, a, a bunch of specific rubber corks for this particular model. And then bring extra two liter, liter bottles. These launchers, um, require that you put two liter bottles duct tape to the end of them. Uh, kids are going to be jumping on those. And if you have a large amount of kids, you're going to have a lot of little feet stomping down on that plastic. And then eventually they break. So if you've got one launcher going, try and have three bottles, two launchers, try and have five bottles, just in case they break. And in the facilitator guide, it does recommend that you use Coca-Cola product bottles. They have, um, the way that their necks are designed are actually a little more durable and they won't break um, when a kid jumps up and down on it. All right, I'm ready. So in this part, I, I like to encourage creativity when um, youth are building their rockets. I encourage them to use all of the material that's given to them and try not to waste. Um, um, if they don't, that's fine. But I like to see what kind of designs youth make out of their rockets. You know, what did they use a straw for? Um, did they you know, uh, what did they use the rubber bands for? What did they use um, uh, the extra um, uh, tissue paper for? Um, I've had some rockets, whenever I do it, I, I have three um, different methods that I like to, I guess, give points on. One is the height of a rocket, one is the accuracy of a rocket, and the other is the creativity of a rocket. Um, and that allows for kids to have three things that they want to strive for. And if, if you have a group of more creative kids and they want, not only do they want an accurate rocket, but they want it to have streamers when it shoots up in the air or um, a lot of bright colors or anything like that, um, you know, let them um, express themselves through the um, STEAM aspect of STEM, which is including art inside this. So, um, in, in my opinion, there are a lot of things that NASA put out are not only effective material, but they are literally works of art they're shooting up into space. So um, make sure you encourage that um, aspect of, of science. And I think, yep, um, the engineering design process is actually a big, um, uh, topic in a lot of our NYSD guides. If you look in a lot of facilitator guides, you will see that uh, engineering design process, especially in the last couple. 
Um, this is a very important process to allow kids to um, not only get their question, but then create an answer to that question by following these steps. Okay, um, and some of the older guides they may ha not have as many steps, but make sure you go through this engineering design process. Make sure that kids don't um, skip any of these steps, um, and at the very least, try and, and encourage them to um, really, really get into the imagination, planning, and creation of it. Um, they will always test and improve as it goes on. Um, the ask and the research really kind of falls upon um, the facilitator to um, to portray to the youth, but getting that other part, the imagining, the planning, the creating, the testing, and the improving um, is, is also very important when it comes to um, designing these rockets. And in these processes, or in this process, there are some um, definite questions you want to ask them. Um, you know, uh, uh, Let's see here, you know, by going over what worked and what didn't, always ask them, um, encourage or let them know that making mistakes causes a better learning um, method. You know, if it failed, that also makes you want to do it better. Um, you know, things like, did the angle of your launching matter? Um, uh, did you make changes after you launched? What did you make? Did it make it better? Um, you know, what are some of the other factors that might have affected your rocket? Were you shooting outside? Was it windy? Was it not windy? Was it rainy? Uh, you know, um, that kind of thing. Did, did the rocket even launch at all? What was the problem with that? Um, so there are a lot of, of things that you can factor in when asking these questions. And, and to me, when working with youth, I, or especially with, when it comes to this, is I always ask them questions. I always want to hear what they are are thinking when it comes to designing and and thinking about what may have gone wrong or what might have went right. So uh, engineering design process is definitely important. And that's pretty much the end of it. Um, again, it, I didn't, you know, I, I went with a very roundabout way of, of kind of describing this because I want everyone to um, really, really kind of make it their own, uh, create and, and design their own uh, projects just based off of the Rockets to the Rescue uh, like I did. Uh, I mean, I didn't completely do it off the wall, but um, I really do like changing things up a lot. So does anyone have any questions? You might've mentioned this and I missed it, but did you, what size group do you recommend to do this activity? Um, in, in most cases, I've been working with groups of about 20 kids. Um, and honestly, with the amount of work that gets put in it, you, you don't want more than four kids to build a rocket at one time, um, just because, uh, there's always that one youth or participant that's just sitting there, like, they're not letting me do anything. So with this kind of thing, um, you, you do want to try and keep lower numbers, but it um, you, you'll definitely want some help. So for me, I, I would work with groups of around 20 um, in general. So um, it, it's really kind of cool to have a lot more rockets. And I honestly get enough extra stuff prepared so that I have it set so that two kids work on one rocket at a time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The National Youth Science Day activity I would like to highlight tonight is Biofuel Blast. The, um, this one was actually created, I believe, back in 2009, so even pre my time um, with Purdue Extension. So really cool kit um, and different than the one that Sam's trying to highlight for you in terms of the quantity of supplies that you need to make this one happen. In fact, most of the kits, uh, I believe when they came to the counties, uh, really didn't include much of anything because the supplies were so simple. So, um, so I'm going to jump on down here. Uh, so with bio, Biofuel Blast, um, here are just the simple supplies that you'll need from that. Um, an empty 20 ounce plastic bottle or even the 16.9 ounce water bottles work just as well. You need white sugar 
access to warm tap water, um, active dry yeast uh, packets. So, and I'm not sure a nine inch balloon is totally necessary. You just need a balloon. Um, not massive, but not super tiny either. Scissors, string, and a small plastic funnel. However, you don't really need a small plastic funnel. I'm not sure you can see mine. Um, so you can actually just make a funnel out of paper and tape if you want to make it as inexpensive as possible. Um, with this activity I've used is just an empty water bottle. Those work just as good. Um, just regular packets of yeast from the grocery store. Um, sugar packets actually work wonderful for this, especially with kids. Um, opening instead of having a bag of sugar and then you have spoons and you're trying to pour it into the bottle or use a paper funnel. So the objective of this activity is really to talk with the kids about the process of fermentation and learning about the gases and kind of the extras that are created through this activity. So through this activity, they learn about sugars that occur in plants. So uh, talk about a lot of um, the natural environment, living things, um, and in the plants, they create their own sugar. Um, cellulose is one that you would highlight there. That would be obviously big vocabulary for younger kids. Um, but as you get up in the older kids, uh, great vocabulary to use with them. And then really explain what biofuels are. Um, so through the process, obviously, a fermentation is actually an organism that is eating and gaining energy. And through that, it releases gases. So through this activity, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to see mine really well because I just have the single camera. So what you do is you put your sugar in the bottle first. Typically, three to four tablespoons will be great. You add in one packet of yeast. And then you just go over to the sink and you get warm tap water. You don't want it super hot that you can't touch it. It'll kill the yeast, but you don't want it room temperature either. It just takes the process that much longer to get going. You need the warmer water to activate the yeast. And then over time, as the kids observe what's happening, you'll notice my balloon on top is beginning to be inflated. And that is actually the release of carbon dioxide. So as the fermentation process is going on, it releases the gas of carbon dioxide, which collects in the balloon up top. And then down inside here, you'll see a lot of foam in here. This is actually where ethanol is being made. So one of the byproducts of this is ethanol. And this opens the discussion with the kids on talking about renewable resources, um, talking about alternative fuels, why those are important, where they see those in today's society, and then obviously looking towards the future. And uh, particularly with your older kids, when you do this activity, you can really dive into fossil fuels and renewable resources and renewable fuels, and why that is probably going to become more and more of a concern um, all around the globe is fossil fuels, which take thousands, hundreds, if not millions of years to be created. Whereas if we have renewable energy sources, such as using um, the sugars produced by plants to create energy, um, in this case for fuel that may power engines and things like that, but also lead you into other discussions with other types of energy that's needed. So just some quick tips that I put on here. Um, obviously you wanna make sure you got enough supplies for your group. If you're doing it in a school, I would recommend even a bottle per kid or maybe one per two. Wanna make sure obviously you have extra packets of yeast with you. Um, it's okay if the kids spill some on the table as they're pouring it in, as long as the majority of it gets in there. But definitely wanna come up with some sort of a funnel to put everything in the, in the bottle. And then obviously bring extra balloons because as kids put the balloon over the over the mouth of the bottle, sometimes if they're not careful, they will rip the balloon. So you want to make sure you have lots of extras of those. So, and like I explained, a pop bottle or a water bottle works great for this. Um, I know when you look at the facilitator guide for this, it will tell you a 20 ounce pop bottle. It doesn't have to be, it can just be a water bottle. Those work just as well. Um, you can 
add on to this activity and do some extensions. So when you look beyond just using white sugar, you can go ahead and also use corn syrup. So just go to the grocery store and get some light corn syrup and put about uh, three tablespoons of that into your, into your bottle. Put the yeast in and then as well as the warm water and then put the balloon on top. Um, it would also, for your older kids, be a great idea to do a control um, with this. So where you just take a bottle, you would put in your yeast and warm water, but you wouldn't put in any food in the bottle. So no, no, no source of sugar in there so that they can see what happens when you do that. This, this activity really can be done anywhere. It could be done in a 4-H club. It could be done in a workshop setting. It could be done in a classroom. Um, you could even set this up as a demonstration at FAIR. Um, junior leaders could actually lead this one. It would be great or also become part of a SPARK club where you did lots of these activities of the National Youth Science Day. One, one hint I'll give you uh, while doing this is it will tell you in the facilitator guide that typically after 10 minutes, you'll really start seeing the reaction. Um, that's not really true. Um, I've tested this out now three times in the past week. And this one right here, you can see the balloon is not very big. Um, and it has been going for almost an hour at this point. So it took 30 minutes till finally there was enough carbon dioxide collected in the balloon that it finally stood upright. So the longer you let this one go, the better reaction you're gonna get and more observations that the kids can make. Um, you can throw math into this activity as well. If you take string, take a string, cut it with some scissors, um, get a nice long piece. And in the kids, you can actually talk about circumference and volume to see actually how much carbon dioxide is really in the balloon. Uh, that's a great extension to this activity. Some things I would definitely recommend that you talk about first as you're going through this activity with a group of kids is talk about those key terms, yeast, fermentation, carbon dioxide, ethanol, fossil fuels. I would even throw in there renewable resources or alternative fuels. Um, really dive into those pieces where the kids are really making the observation and thinking through what it is that they're seeing, um, what's in the balloon, um, what's in the bottle. Is the bottle just the ingredients that we put in there or do we now have a new item in the bottle? And then, like I said, with the older kids, you can really dive into fossil fuels and alternative, re alternative energy sources and what those are and what those look like. And then um, the, one of the extension activities, when you use the corn syrup, you'll notice that the reaction time is even greater. That one, I didn't see the balloon actually stand upright until it was past an hour. Um, and if you actually let them set for an even longer period of time, the balloon will inflate relatively large. So if you were gonna set this up in terms of a workshop or with uh, say a spark club activity, probably roll this activity out first, get it going and get it started, and then move on to another activity and then come back maybe 30 minutes later or say even an hour later and then have the kids do their observation with that one. So, all right, I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, but I'll open it up if anybody has any questions. Hello, my name is Liz Byersdorfer and I'm the 4-H Youth Educator in Dearborn County and I'm going to be talking to you today about Motion Commotion. This uh, National Youth Science Day kit came out in 2015 um, and it has some great things in there that can really engage youth. Let me share my screen. So, as I said, it came out in 2015. Um, if you can find the kit there, it might be in your extension office somewhere or in a storage facility that you have. The kit itself is pretty simple. It contains two plastic cars, one yellow plastic track, play clay, and a student guide. Um, if you don't have these items, you can always substitute the cars by using um, 
some little plastic cards that you might be able to get from a dollar store or even matchbox cards if you needed to. Um, if you don't have the track, you could also improvise by using maybe a trifold poster um, to give it some strength and that way you could have the elevation as well. So be creative if you can't find all the pieces um, that are should be in your kit. Uh, with this kit, there are two activities actually in that facilitator's guide. Number one is the car crash, and it takes 45 to 55 minutes. And also we need more time, uh, which takes 15 to 20 minutes. So what do you need to know? Uh, if you found your kit and it's been used, you probably are going to have to replace and replenish the, the play clay or play dough. And I, especially in these times, um, you may choose not to use the play dough or the clay. Um, but once we get back to maybe the typical time, um, it does add another benefit because that little clay person can act as a person and the kids can kind of see what happens when crashes occur. Uh, check how many kits that you have so that you know how many stations and the number of participants that you can manage. And this activity can be used in a variety of settings. It can be used in the classroom. It could be at a 4-H meeting. It could be a demonstration station at the fair. Or it could be as part of a spark club um, in, in your county. It re does require additional items in order to complete it so that you're going to need more things that just come in the box. Uh, for activity number one, you're going to need anywhere from five to six or maybe even seven thick books. Those are stacked high uh, to elevate the track. And then you're going to need an additional thick book to use uh, for the car to crash into. And then you also are going to need a tissue box um, so that the to crash into. Um, and for activity number two, you will need rulers. Activity number one, as I said, uh, it's stop and go science requires at least 45 to 50 minutes. Activity number two is gonna take another 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, just, you could, don't have to do both. You can just do one or uh, the other actually. Tips for the classroom. Um, if you've got most schools, uh, working with schools, they're gonna have a set activity time and that's probably gonna be maybe 45 to 50 minutes long. Um, so you're gonna have to kind of adapt your lessons. As I said, I use the, the crash the cars just because I, that's all the time I can really get it in effectively. Um, make sure that you set up each station ahead of time so that you're not using that time. Um, ask the teacher to provide the books and the Kleenex boxes. So encyclopedias and dictionaries work really well. And almost all teachers have enough uh, Kleenex boxes in their classroom that you can borrow that. Space stations out, obviously, so that kids can get around them. I think having, if possible, no more than five to six kids per station. That may not be possible, but that's a good amount. Explain that every child gets a chance to do the experiment of rolling a card to crash on the track. Um, and for each phase of the experiment, every child must act as an observer to see what happens during the experiment. And then the station will select one person to share the observations of the experiments with the rest of the classroom. So that brings us to the actual lesson itself, um, the, just the basics of Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. Number one is, an object at rest stays at rest unless acted on by an unbalanced force, meaning a moving force. So a good representation of that could be you could just put a water bottle on the table and say, see, it's not moving. There's nothing affecting it. It's sitting very still. So an object at rest stays at rest. Law number two, the greater the amount of mass or matter of the object being accelerated, the greater the amount of force needed to accelerate it. So the example that I give with this is if I were at the school and I wanted to try to pull a school bus all by myself in the parking lot, uh, do you think that could happen? Well, obviously, no, that's not going to happen. But if we got all the kids in the school or all the kids in the third grade class or whatever uh, together and connected and tried to pull that school bus, we probably could because we have much more matter than the school bus at that point. You also need to describe the difference between matter and weight 
Matter is what composes our bodies, our books, our tables, our chairs, um, and that doesn't change. But weight does change based on gravity. So if I went to the moon, I would not weigh near as much as what I do um, on Earth, unless, of course, I, you know, like cut my arm off. So um, matter stays consistent. And law number three is the, is the most fun and engaging, I think, because for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And the way that I describe this and, and engage the kids is ask for a child volunteer to stand opposite me in the room. I stand at the other end and I'm like, here's my, here's my um, invisible baseball. Can you see it? You know, can you envision the, the red stripes? Here's my ball. And then ask the kids if they can see the invisible bat that the student has uh, that they're going to be hitting my ball with. And then we talk, you know, I'm like, I make a big deal out of the wind up and whew, yeah, throw the ball. Um, even go so far as to maybe have the kids clap when the child be visible bat hits the ball just to help keep engaged in following along. Um, and then we ask questions like, well, where did that ball go? I threw the ball this way. Why well, you're telling me it's going back the other direction? Um, how did that happen? And you relate that to for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I also use my hands on this. Um, so palms up, equal and opposite reaction because that, that motion also helps the kids retain the information. So what really needs to happen? Um, obviously you're gonna have your book stack set up. You're gonna have the track inserted and the kids, if you choose to do this, the kids can make the clay figures that go in the car. And then you're gonna place a heavy book at the base of the book stack on the track uh, to begin with and ask the kids to crash. Each child gets a chance to crash their car into that book. Um, as the, every child is at an opportunity, you can move that book further back down the track. Um, that, then you can actually replace that book with a Kleenex box and repeat those steps. Put the Kleenex box at the base of the stack and then move it back bit by bit as the kids have had a chance to crash their cars. Each child should have the chance to roll the car into the book and the Kleenex box at every station that it's at. Uh, so multiple rolls. And every child needs to watch and observe what happens to the car, the clay figure in the car, the book, and the Kleenex. Um, and so there's a list of questions that you can use, and I have included them as a resource about how to actually observe what's really happening there. When the adult moves between stations, you need to watch what's happening um, as they crash and then relate what you observe um, to one of the three laws of motion. Ask them, which one, which law do you think this is? Um, in order to get them to also further understand what those uh, laws really mean and what they look like. Um, as I say, ask questions about the observations. You can use that list that I have shared or you can come up with your own questions. I always allow seven to 10 minutes of the youth just experimenting and playing with it. And I try not to interfere if they want to um, take the Kleenex box and put it under the ramp. I don't care. It, to me, it's all good that they're experimenting. But the, the majority is that they need, need to do the, what you've asked them to do first, making sure they have someone that can with on their observations. And then finally, <clears throat> you're going to come back together as a group um, and someone from the, the group will actually share what the observations were that they found. And usually each group is going to have a little bit slightly different story to tell, especially if they did any experimenting on their own. Um, and I usually end up finally then by asking how the laws of motion affect safety in people. So when that little clay figure flew out of the car and its head popped off, what would that mean if it was a real person? Or even to the extent of if you're walking, uh, riding a bike, and you uh, aren't paying attention and you cross a road and a car hits you, what's going to happen? Um, it has to do with matter, right? Uh, the more matter, the more force. So we are not going to win that, that accident if that happens. Just wanted to show you some pictures of experiments in action. We've got um, the car sitting up on top. We also see that there's another car that is crashed into the book. 
Um, in this case, the, the car is, they probably put too much force, too much acceleration when they pushed that car, but it's kind of sliding down the track into the Kleenex box. Um, and this one just gives you a nice picture of how all the kids are getting involved and the setup of the, the stacked books, how the track, and it's easy, it's better if you can get that track to be a little more gradual instead of so steep, but at the very beginning, it's going to be steep anyhow. There is an instructional video that I would recommend. It lasts eight minutes, so I don't want to take the time to show it to you uh, this evening. But there, this is a great video to help walk you through the whole process of how to teach this lesson. So if you need to come back and refresh yourself or you just want to see some new ideas about how to present it, this is a great resource. And at this point, then there are questions. So we will open it up for questions. Okay, the year was 2011. Grenade by Bruno Mars was a top song. Colored denim was a top fashion. And Wired for Wind was the National Youth Science Day uh, experiment. It offered hands-on experimentation, engaging young people in design, build out, and testing of turbine models. Okay, the objectives and outcomes of this experiment, it's to increase the interest in science and engineering. Um, it tricks, it, a lot of times when youth are involved in this uh, activity, this experiment, they don't realize the amount of science and energy and engineering that's involved in it. So it almost tricks them um, as they're learning of, hey, this is science. Hey, I'm building, uh, which is a really good thing. Uh, introducing the engineering design process, which Sam explained so well along with terminology, understanding uh, the purpose of a wind turbine, some of its basic parts and mechanisms, um, how the turbine works to convert wind power to electricity and to kick in that critical thinking uh, when we identify appropriate locations for wind farms. So um, as we move on to the next slide, uh, when I came to my county office, this kit was in a box with wires all over the place. I am sorry in my picture, you do not see the red and black wires that will run off the generator. Um, and pieces were kind of all over the place. Uh, you cannot purchase this kit any further. However, on either side of my county, there are multiple kits. So please consider reaching out to your neighbors if you do not have complete kits but these are the basic parts aside from this uh, red and black wire that connects to your generator that isn't included in this uh, picture. So the PCV or PVC assembly is that T, the blue and the white PVC pieces um, with the turbine hub, Small generator, which is this piece right here connected to the wiring. Um, and you may find that your generator moves a little too much within the container that this generator is to sit in. I actually used duct tape around the outside of the generator to make it a tighter fit. So as you're attaching um, the hub onto the generator, it's not going to slide all the way in and make it difficult to attach. Uh, the multimeter, your protractor, and the wood dowels for, um, from which you'll make the blades. Additional materials you'll need. They talk about using hot glue to attach your design to the dowel for the blades. 
Um, if you do that, you'll have to replace your dowels on a regular basis. I've used uh, painter's tape, I've used masking tape, and I have even used scotch tape, and it holds fairly well. So I recommend, so you don't have to replace your dowels to um, use those types of tape. My office is pretty uh, thrifty in saving paper, recycling it, along with, as we empty files, saving file folders. Those are wonderful materials to use for blades, along with paper cups you can create blades out of. Um, but you will notice as you go through this experiment, the different thicknesses of material that you use for your blade will determine um, a good portion of the success. Um, and you will also need a fan for which you will place your, um, your generator, your wind turbine in front of so that you can measure the amount of voltage output that your um, wind turbine gives off based on the design. Now, I have used box fans and I have the most luck with the box fan. Um, I had a volunteer help me in a classroom of 30 kids. I wanted at least two stations to test out designs. Uh, she happened to bring a tower fan. That doesn't work as well because in a tower fan, the, the uh, air that comes out of a tower fan is equally distributed where a box fan basically blows it straight out. So I recommend using a box fan. Um, there is also a student guide aside from the facilitator guide that we'll have uh, with this presentation that you can still uh, download from the National Youth Science Day uh, site. So if you're interested in that student guide, you can um, obtain it there. Next, please. So to get started, it really begins with conversation. Um, you know, talking about what, what items that youth are around that require electricity in order to operate and what things don't require electricity. Um, what do they think life might be like if we didn't have electricity? Uh, some may experience storms where their power goes out and that's, that brings quite an awareness to them that all of a sudden um, my heat goes out or all of a sudden um, water is an issue. So um, nice points to bring to the forefront of the importance of electricity. Also talking about uh, the non-renewable energy sources and renewable energy sources. So there are three steps to this entire experiment. The first one is the design and build process, which um, the facilitator guide lists at 45 minutes. I have actually had the design and build process. I've had kids stay involved for two and a half to three hours because they go back and go back and go back to retest. Um, they, um, I did this at a fair. It was an outreach fair at a school where I was there representing 4-H. There were other um, people there bringing awareness to youth programming. And I had a table with this, uh, this activity and had my box fan. And not only did youth want to stay at my table, which was a good thing, but they brought their parents to the table. So that was a really good way to talk about 4-H while they're engaged and realizing, um, wow, with just these simple pieces, I'm creating energy. Um, and because it is displayed 
on that multimedia. It's, it's that confirmation of what I am doing is really producing energy. So um, the first thing when uh, in this design process is to identify the problem. How can we turn wind into electrical power? That wind being your box fan. Uh, generating ideas. This is where I will let them know. We'll start with um, our dowels recommending two to four dowels with a cod. The reason you don't choose one is because it's not going to work very efficiently. And six dowels are really a commitment. It is time consuming. Um, I've had very few youth that actually had the patience to develop more than four blade designs to test out. So six is a huge commitment where you're looking at exact design. And when we talk about pitch, getting the exact pitch with all six uh, blades. So I recommend two to four, uh, but once they have those tools and I give them an idea of here's a design I tried and here's a design I tried, they start off wanting fancy blade designs that they learn very quickly are not effective. They give poor results. So that's the, the building the prototype that two, three and four blades, you can do six, uh, but it is quite the commitment. Um, you can, you're better off with a medium design versus very small or my very large design. Um, and then testing it. I've had um, multiple box fans with a volunteer at the, I'm at one box fan, volunteers are at the others. And we test out, we show the youth the multimeter so that as that blade is spinning on the generator, they're able to read wow, that's my output. I will even post a sticky uh, large post-it on the wall, uh, keeping track of the output from the blades that have come to my box fan. It gets them a little competitive. They wanna see if they can beat that other number. So that's what drives them to go back and try and redesign. So recording those observations really makes them aware of, I can do better. Let me try a new design. So that's when they go back and redefine their design. Now the next step is the pitch. And in the kit, there is a, a protractor. And if you look at it, you can see how you can line up the blade with the dowel and adjusting the uh, blade to a certain angle. Even though these pro protractors are available to the youth, it's really interesting once they start working with redesign, they automatically start playing with the pitch. You'll see them the minute they leave realizing, ah, maybe my blade design was too flat and they'll loosen up the cog and start playing with pitch on their own. And they'll actually use the protractor to see, hmm, what pitch did I set it at? But um, it's nice to see them willing to um, use their own critical thinking in determining what they feel the pitch, the right pitch would be. So this pitch step number two, or part two, is a very natural step that you a lot of times will not intentionally need to go into because the kids are ready to roll. And let me change the pitch. Let me retest. Let me get back to that fan as fast as I can. And after they check their pitch or adjust pitch, that's when it really occurs to them, my blade design is not going to work 
as effectively as I want it or it is and how can I go even further with it. So again, it's important to record the um, observations, which is recording those output um, numbers on your multimeter. And um, it, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how once you give youth the tools, they take it and run. I do point out to them that I'm a fan of failing forward. It is a good thing to fail and learn, as uh, Sam had pointed out. Don't be afraid to fail, but let's fail forward. Let's learn from the failure we had. That's a part of the process. So wind farms um, are popping up across Indiana and counties have opinions about them. My county is in the very northern part of Indiana. Uh, wind turbines are a novelty up here. Uh, youth and adults are um, interested in wind turbines and interested due to the fact that it doesn't invade their space. However, if you are in a county where this is a controversial topic, um, you may want to approach the topic with either a little more ease, um, maybe talking about advantages, disadvantages. If you have adults around you when you're working with this experiment, adults may express their opinions about it. So just be aware of what the opinions in your county are about wind farms. Because what's the last part or the last, uh, yeah, last step, part three step is really looking at where in the state is there the greatest potential for wind power. So this almost becomes a debate. You're doing research uh, and drawing a conclusion as to where uh, they feel with calculations the best place for wind farms in Indiana, your county, you could even talk about your city, would be the best place. So the learning opportunities with this experiment it can be a one hour event. I have held um, this experiment in an in-school 4-H club, an after-school program, and I have made it a one hour quick experience. It was about building the, wind, the uh, blades, testing the blades, and looking at pitch very, very quick. However, I have easily taken this and used parts one through three and have had a six week, one hour spark club on uh, the experiment. And then you can also take part three and make it just a debate opportunity. Um, you can use it in, um, I actually have a speech club. They've used this section and turned it into a speech. Um, so this is something to have used at an outreach fair. Uh, I grabs the attention of parents, which is a good, good draw for 4-H for them to want to know more about 4-H um, at fair in schools. Uh, additional considerations are the um, audience, age audience. Um, younger ones, easily are ready to design, build these blades. Uh, their attention span is not going to be for as long, say uh, a mini 4 -er or a third grader. However, in fifth grade, middle school, even up into high school, uh, they were really challenged and, and I could spend more time on this topic. There was more um, they were willing to discuss points more leading into the experiment and coming out. 
uh, know how much time you have, know that you need to be flexible. Um, I have had cogs, which is your hub here. I have had these uh, strip. So all of a sudden now I can't get my dowels out of here. Um, and so you need to be flexible. I've had a box fan go down, um, but there is so much to talk about this exp experiment that you can keep it rolling. And always check your equipment, make sure it's functioning properly. This multimeter requires a battery. Um, you want to make sure these multimeters are working. Uh, youth are, at least the youth I work with, tend to leave it on when they're done instead of turning it off. So you wanna make sure your equipment is shut off at the end. You wanna make sure that the wiring to your generator is working properly. Um, these are things that um, could prevent you from having a successful um, experience with Wired for Wind. I believe that is the... Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>